Let us start off number one with a trivia question. Who said this? Are you ready? This is coming from MedPage today in reference to the Cape Cod Cluster Breakout. And here we go. Quote, this finding is concerning and was a pivotal discovery leading to CDC's updated mask recommendation. She said, saying it was updated to ensure, this is a quote, the vaccinated public would not unknowingly transmit virus to others, including their unvaccinated or immunocompromised loved ones. The answer to your trivia question, you can see part of the hint right there, is Walensky. And Walensky, of course, is the CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, MD. And this quote was quite revealing, yet somehow went completely under the radar of the news pools, which many of us listen to. But right off the bat, let's start off with it. It is now August 1st, 1 and 12 a.m. And good morning to our data analysts, data scientists, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, bioinformatics, uh, policymakers, and all friends alike who would just like a data slant. We are going to begin first with the disclaimer before we get into the database, like you see here. But our disclaimer, just because our fact checker friends out there and it's important just the same. We are going to be looking at the VAERS database from the CDC itself. And the reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. And large reports, large part, reports to VAERS are voluntary, which means they are subject to biases. And we showed you that before with references to duplicated reports, so on and so forth. So the VAERS database, although very comprehensive, uh, still needs to have elements verified, albeit it is a huge database compared to prior years. And I don't know f how long it's going to take to uh, go through it with all the CDC researchers out there that have to go through that tremendous database. But let us begin as we begin to start. So real fast, we are going to be looking at the VAERS database. And of course, a lot of you want to have the first question answered. How many reports have been submitted to the VAERS database as we see? And I'm scrolling down real fast. Let's get this window out of the way real fast as well. There. And there we are. As of July 23rd, 2021, we are at, and remember this is reports, and all duplicates have been removed. And we're going to go through that in a second too. So the, data, uh, the other data analysts and scientists out there don't make the mistake of accidentally counting uh, some of the reports which may have been reported, some of the various IDs which may have reported over and over again. Well, we'll get that in a second. But we're at 428,483 uh, vaccine adverse event reports compared to 57,115 of all of 2020. With that in mind, let us begin. We are going to be covering the articles as follows. We are going to be looking at number one, highly potent stable nanobody stop SARS-CoV-2 wonderful article and it's actually really kind of a cute article on top of that too yep it, the title pretty much says what it's meant to say no particular risk of infection from SARS-CoV-2 from cash remember in the very beginning when this whole thing began uh they had a lot of speculation in reference to that well one year and some months later no number three AI reveals how glucose helps the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This was an incredible research article from a, a basically um, Blue Brain, and it was used the Python data frame, which I'm automatically a fan of. And what was really remarkable about this is that a lot of the research organizations lowered their paywall down. And people don't realize that research that the pre, you know, outside of our, our typical data analysts and scientists and other researchers as well, don't realize you have to pay to see a lot of these full studies. Well, there was remarkable cooperation where they actually dropped that paywall down for Blue Brain in which they were able to analyze all the databases and find like a natural language processing, uh, which words came up the most in reference to severe outcomes, and it was glucose. And we'll go into that in a second as well. And two, we are going to be covering basically, 
No, that's the British Medical Journal. We'll go that. I want to review that in a second. Uh, we'll be covering the the effects of the Cape Cod cluster outbreak, especially this little piece of information right here. And even though there's a lot of variables that can play a role, the one th the one thing, unless the data collection is inappropriate or needs or there's a problem in reference to the data collection, that stands out more than anything else, even more so than this is a CDC document, by the way. Uh, more so than the breakthrough infections on the vaccinated was the viral load of the vaccinated. And there was a real misconception that goes out there where people think that the vaccine somehow it was designed to prevent transmission. And, you know, if we look at, for example, what the British Medical Journal brought up a long time ago, um, uh, if you read that one article before we get to it, they were not uh, determined to interrupt transmission of the virus when they are originally designed. In fact, even the chief medical officer said our trial will not demonstrate prevention of transmission. And then somehow something got into the way where basically the, the impression that reducing the viral load, which makes logical sense, reducing the viral load will somehow reduce transmission. And I'm not going to add publisher bias, but that was the general assumption. But that wasn't necessarily what the trials were designed to, to determine. And there is other issues with regard to variants. The Delta was not around at the same time the vaccine was designed. And, you know, and on and on and on. But other research we're looking at, we, let's go to this. Uh, there's also breakthrough infections now in healthcare workers. This is an Israeli study. And that's original to the B117, the alpha variant. And they're beginning to experience breakthrough uh, breakthrough infections as well. And I think it was, what, 2.9% or something like that. And then I want to go into a brief example of the problems, and I want to tread very lightly on this, on the problems they had with the SARS-CoV-1 uh, vaccine. And we're going to cover that in a little bit as well, too. But otherwise, we covered the disclaimer. And these are our data sources, health, uh, healthdata.gov. The vaccine there is again. That's the size of our database right now. Uh, it's compared to other years. Our world and data. Uh, GS, GIS aid is also going to be one of our sources too, in reference to the uh, the variants. Uh, but that's going to be proxied through our world and data. And then we're going to go basically look at this, the monoclonal antibody. Oh, let's just start with this real fast. All right. This has to do with emergency use authorization in reference to the vaccines. Now keep in mind, in order for emergency use authorization to be approved for a vaccine, there has to be no other viable treatment. Now, here is the intriguing question. You ready for this? I'm not going to say anything beyond what it states. FDA expanded the emergency use authorization for the monoc monoclonal antibody cocktail and oh my gosh, Casirvimab and I, I'm the Vimab. Listen, it's 120 a.m. I got, I got, I have justification. Uh, to include post-exposure prophylactics among certain people exposed to COVID-19, the manufacturer Regeneron announced on Friday, which I'm glad. But however, though, again, we have to look at the emergency use authorization in reference to mandating a vaccine once a viable treatment has been approved. And the FDA uh, basically just expanded its EA, EA emergency use authorization for this. Specifically, the therapy is for those at high risk of progressing to severe COVID-19 who either were not fully vaccinated or not expected to mount an adequate response to vaccination, as well as for those with a high risk of exposure, such as in nursing home and prison. So basically, again, I don't know enough uh, in reference to it. Maybe one of the, the data scientists or basically researchers or farm tech may know more. So I would really appreciate, appreciate if I could pronunciate, enunciate, uh, the input on that. But again, this is a, a treatment that has been authorized through emergency use. Does that nullify or not nullify? Well, I should say, yeah, nullify the emergency use, use authorization for the vaccines and since now there is a viable alternative treatment. I don't know. Again, that's a question not for me to answer, but again, looking at the semantics and the language in the FDA 
uh, Emergency Use Authorization Act for the vaccines, I am curious. All right, but let us begin as follows. First one is really fascinating. Highly potent, stable nanobody stop SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, it's, it's, it is as cute as a breakthrough, as, as important as the breakthrough is. Uh, Gottingham, researchers have developed many antibodies that effectively block. I am reading verbatim fact checkers. I am not any publisher bias, so I'm solely quoting from the Max Planck Institute, and they are very credible. These so-called antibodies bind and neutralize the virus up to 1,000 times better than previously developed mini antibodies. In addition, the scientists optimized their mini antibodies for stability and resistance to extreme heat. This unique combination makes them promising agent, a promising agent, to treat COVID-19 since antibodies can be produced at low cost and in large quantities. They could meet the global demand for COVID-19 therapeutics. The new antibodies are currently in preparation for clinical trials. Scrolling down for the first time, they combine extreme stability and outstanding efficacy against the virus and its alpha, beta, gamma, and delta mutants. Quoting, our antibodies can withstand temperatures of up to 95 degrees centigrade without losing their function or forming aggregates, which is real important, technical, but important. Quoting, our single nanobodies are potentially suitable for inhalation and thus for direct virus neutral, like for example, like a nasal spray or something like that, Direct virus neutralization in the respiratory tract, or like, remember, like a, a mist where you just spray. Quote, in addition, because they are very small, they could readily penetrate tissues and prevent the virus from spreading further at the site of infection. I am quoting from the news article, now the research article, once again. In addition, because they are very small, they could readily penetrate tissues and prevent the virus from spreading further at the site of infection. For all danta, nan, nanto, for all nanobody variants, monomeric, double as well as triple, the researchers found that the very small amounts are sufficient to stop the pathogen. If used as a drug, this would allow for a low dosage and thus for fewer side effects and lower production cost. Alpacas provide the blueprints for the mini antibodies. I love the, love this part. Again, just again, cuteness and science tend not to go hand in hand, but I, I still like the presentation, regardless. Our antibodies originate from alpacas and are smaller and simpler than conventional antibodies. And they immunize three alpacas, Brita, Nora, and Xenia. The mares then produced antibodies and the scientists drew a small blood sample from the animals. For the alpacas, the mission was then complete. As all Further steps were carried out with the help of enzymes, bacteria, so-called bacteria, uh, bacteriophages, and yeast. The overall burden on our animals is very low, comparable to vaccination and blood testing in humans. See, there's a little dig there. Going further, some of the nanobodies were really impressive. Less than a millionth of a gram per liter of medium was enough to completely prevent infection. I am going to reiterate that again. Again, there have been so many incredible breakthroughs in reference to disease treatment in relation to coronaviruses, uh, which just are under the radar on basically in reference to the news pools, meaning the media does not love us. But still just the same, researchers have done an incredible job it has been basically, uh, in how I would describe it, uh, an inadequacy of the general belief that if something good came out, that the media would actually see it. Well, that's, I don't know. I think they enjoy the, uh, the panic too much. Some of the antibodies were really impressive. Less than a millionth of a, I digress. Less than a millionth of a gram per liter was enough to completely prevent infection. In the case of the nanobody triads, even another 20-fold dilution was sufficient. That is incredible. And also effective against current coronavirus variants. To read, 
the researchers had inoculated their alpacas with part of the spike protein of its first known SARS-CoV-2 over virus. But remarkably, the animal's immune system also all oh, this is incredible, also produced antibodies that are active against the different virus variants. Quote, should our nanobodies prove ineffective against a future variant, we can re-immunize the alpacas. Since they have already been vaccinated against the virus, they would very quickly produce antibodies against the new variant. Now think about that. The, the presentation in reference to the, the medical prophylactic, you know, basically the typical new medicine, even if it was a vaccine per se, the presentation is extremely uh, endearing. And this type of communication in reference to the storytelling and basically and how this was developed how it came about and the innocence in basically the explanation in reference to the uh, almost jovial uh, excitement in the discovery is really a great way of basically uh, how to describe it. Uh, I don't want to utilize the word disarming, but in as well I would use the word endearing once again, endearing the public to uh, a greater medical option as opposed to what we're doing today in reference to vaccinations where we're demeaning individuals that question and you know take for example the tetanus shot people don't see the tetanus shot as a vaccine but it was one of the greatest communications in reference to this individual uh, being open to a vaccine no one tried to slam anybody over the head or call them not as smart as they hoped they would be or say they're responsible for other people getting sick or whatever it came down to be. It, people would, in fact, they would rarely ever hesitate to get a tetanus shot because they didn't group it into that, that tribal element of vaccine. But again, you understand what I mean and I digress. But if, the, if alpaca had a vaccine or a pocket vaccine, I guarantee if you took the word vaccine out of it and just said, uh, you know, whatever al alpaca treatment um, or alpaca prophylactics or alpaca inhalant, you'd have people wearing t-shirts running around uh, saying, I've been in pocket, you know, alpaca. You know what I mean? You see, you see what I mean? It's, it's more of a, a better presentation, but again, I digress. Next one. Ba -ba -ba. No particular risk of infection from SARS COVID or cash. Fear of contagion is driving much more contactless payment during the pandemic. It would not be necessary. So basically, they went through the whole thing, and you recognize the fact is uh, they didn't see that it was transmitting. So we're going to go to the next one for the sake of expediency. AI reveals how glucose helps the SARS COVID 2 virus. Again, as I reiterated or alluded to in the beginning, this was a one, a wonderful, wonderful example of open cooperation where the pay, pay walls were dropped in order for the free flow of information in which they automatically got AI to go and data mine all this stuff. And in an, so you think, for example, oh, a pandemic and the whole world is coming together in reference to fighting the coronavirus or whatever comes out. No, it's not. There's a lot of profit to be made and a lot of resistance to open sharing of information. But in this case, in this case, it was a free flow of information, and I'd love to see more examples of this. But here we go. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the COVID-19 Open Research Data Set, COVID-19, of over 400,000 scholarly articles were made open access, including 150,000 with full text papers related to COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, and other coronaviruses. A simple analysis by this text mining toolbox, Blue Brain Search of the COVID-19 V47 data set revealed papers that all pointed to glucose metabolism as the most frequently mentioned biological variable. And again, use Python. And Python is the exact same thing you see what I do with the data sets. And again, part of the reason I don't think we have been censored or pulled over the past 42 weeks of videos is because we can explain it relatively clearly by utilizing and showing the Python framework as I scroll through the pages. And plus the fact is a lot of fact checkers as well as I am are, are, are either are or Python enthusiasts, which is just for those not familiar, it's, it's like a small group and it's really super cool of 
people that really enjoy uh, finding different ways to, to uh, look through data. And so well, let's proceed. Scientists immediately went to work with the pandemic started within a year, published over 100,000 papers. <laughs> but can anyone read so many papers? Trust me, I, I miss a lot too, and I read almost everything. Can anyone see and understand all the patterns across this research? Good question. Fortunately, the coalition behind the Core 19 data set convinced all subscription publishers to bring these papers over their subscription paywall and make them openly accessible so they can be mined with modern machine learning and knowledge engineering technologies. That is cool. Therefore, it is right to only make science papers that are publicly funded, open to the public during a pandemic. See, people don't realize that. People are like, ah, they're scaring people left and right and running around. But no, you can't. You don't have. You cannot have access to our information unless you pay me money. That's what this whole pandemic has been: is basically these massive paywalls. And if you want to get all the research available and thrown in front of you, uh, if you're just basically a you know, researcher with limited budget, it's going to cost you a lot of money to delve into all of these databases. But here, let's proceed. Therefore, it is right to make science papers that are publicly funded open to the public during a pandemic when the same kind of technique can be used to help address so many other diseases, accelerate science, and help save the planet from climate change. All right, they added that on there, but regardless of that, what they're saying is if you're really, truly serious about this, really, really serious, then, then basically drop the paywalls. You know, allow research institutions to make money, but not profit from publicly funded research. Often you'll see when I when I refer to an abstract, then you'll say, you don't have to see the whole article, you have to pay 30 bucks for 24 hours, and it's publicly funded research, but yet you have to pay and you're part of the public to see the research that your tax dollars went to go pay for. Yeah, you get the point. But still, let's proceed with this one. This is important because this is just incredible. All right, so here we go. We're gonna look at the full study, obviously published. Uh, machine generated view of the role of blood glucose levels in the severity of COVID-19. It is a huge uh, research article. So I'm only going to go through a few of the highlights. And here we go. Da, 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 da. And even scrolling down may take a lot of time. So here we go. Here we go. Intent. This is where they come with the glucose. This is interesting from a hospital setting. So let us read. Patients in ICU have a high risk of hyperglycemia, independent of history of diabetes due to stress of the disease and or hospital... Dang, what just happened there? You know what I did? I hit the footnote. Let's go back up. And da, 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 da. that was so anticlimactic. Let's not click that again. Here we go. Do, 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 do. Speed reading, speed reading, speed reading, speed reading. There we are. All right. Keep the mouse away from there. Term, uh, patients are at risk of high, hyperglycemia, independent history of diabetes due to the stress of the disease and or hospitalization termed Stress hyperglycemia. For those uh, medical professionals out there and nurses, I'd be really curious if you can uh, chime in on this one because, again, I love the experience of those who are actually on the front lines. Or do the internal parenteral feeding. Now, I checked out the stats, and there is a freaking ton of dextrose in a lot of the things that they, they put into those, uh, uh, into those feeding packs. That is commonly rich in glucose or dextrose. And hyperglycemia has been reported to predict poor prognosis for diverse, critically ill patients. A review of the literature thus far shows that the different groups known to be at risk for severe COVID-19 are likely to present with some of the level of hyperglycemia, impaired fasting glucose, or IGT, suggested the reduced glucose metabolic capacity and or induced elevations of blood sugar could explain why the known preconditions are risk factors for COVID-19 complications and mortality. So they ran through all the databases and they noticed this came up a lot. And what they're saying is, especially in intensive care, two things. The stress of being in intensive care can mess with your blood sugar. Even if you're a prior healthy individual, obviously, you're in ICU, so something else must have went on. And two, uh, a lot of the... Uh, Feeding methods or feeding mechanisms are very high in their case. They mentioned glucose. When I looked at the formula, it was dextrose, but, you know, splitting hairs. It's just sugar, a lot of it. So the recommendations obvious will be obvious if they're concerned about high levels of glucose. And so I'm just going to read the headlines from this real fast. And again, all the links will be there on the YouTube site. 
Elevated glucose favors viral replication. Viral replication. Um, scroll down a little bit more. Elevated glucose contributes to severe complications of COVID-19. Elevated glucose drives the immune response into a cytokine storm. And let's see. Elevated glucose contributes to the development of multi-organ failure. Elevated glucose favors thrombotic events. Elevated glucose increases the risk of secondary pulmonary infection. Now the therapeutic approaches. All right, there's the problems. What is the potential answer that needs to be investigated? Glucose lowering medications. Lowering carbohydrates in the diet and they even showed how basically they referenced the ketogenic diet. And you can read the, the footnotes there and as well. And they go through the whole thing. And I think that's about the, here's the last highlight. The result is overwhelming collective evidence that elevated blood glucose arising from clinically or subclinical pathology in glucose metabolism or from induced hyperglycemia due to hospitalization drug treatments and intravenous infusions in ICU should be considered as a biomarker that correlates with and hence is predictive of severity of COVID-19, as well as evidence that elevated glucose can cause an acceleration of virtually every step of the SARS-CoV-2 infection. Rigorous clinical trials and therefore called for to determine whether elevated glucose is in fact the predominant underlying driver of disease severity. Real important. All right, now we go to the next article. Make sure there's nothing else I highlighted there. Ooh, well, that's actually kind of cool. Lots of formulas. All right, here we go. Before we get into this, all right, I don't want to add, it's very difficult not to add publisher bias. So what I am going to do is I'm going to read from the British Medical Journal what they were concerned about back in October 2020 in reference to the uh, vaccine trial designs. Quote from the, the first report, the world has bet the farm on vaccines, and they have, because there have been a lot of other potential medical paths that could have been taken, but everything, the whole ball of wax was thrown into the vaccine uh bet. The world has bet the farm on vaccines as a solution to the pandemic, but the trials are not focused on answering the questions many might assume they are. And I will have this link on the YouTube as well. It's from the British Medical Journal. Because it's great for historical reference into if something does go wrong, uh, to look back and find out what went wrong. The current phase of trials are not actually set up to prove either uh, either None of the trials, let's, let's go back. Peter Hotstein in the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston said, quote, ideally you want an antiviral vaccine to do two things. First, reduce the likelihood you will get severely ill and go to the hospital. And two, prevent infection and therefore interrupt disease transmission. Yet the current phase three trials are not actually set up to prove either. None of the trials currently underway are designed to detect a reduction in any serious outcome such as hospital admissions, use of intensive care, or deaths. Nor are the vaccines being studied to determine whether they can interrupt transmission of the virus. And then they interviewed the chief medical officer at Moderna. And I'll pull out one highlight. And that's not fair for me to pull one quote out of context. So look at the whole uh, you know, interview in, in context. But... For the sake of expediency, I don't have the opportunity to go through the whole article, but I will put, pull this part out. Our trial, this is Moderna, will not, and I will repeat, not demonstrate prevention of transmission. Doesn't mean it doesn't, but the trial does not. It says because in order to do that, you have to swab people twice a week for very long periods, and that becomes operationally untenable. And so that makes it difficult. Go into the rest of the studies you want. Um, there's debating endpoints on there as well, to be fair. Now, here we go into, I don't want to utilize the word, um, anything in reference to the efficacy or 
how effective the vaccines are outside of what we've known they've been studied for. And of course, with their different variants, uh, is I would not even want to utilize the word breakthrough because it was not designed to prevent transmission or treat a certain variant. Then I can't. It's, you can't really say vaccine failure. It just was never designed for that variant. And so I'm not trying to be kind in reference to that. But however, though, was it D614G was the original variant? And does it even exist anymore? And now we're talking Delta, Alpha, Delta, Beta, Gamma, you know what I mean? It changes. So it's a new variant. So did that mean the vaccine failed? Or is the vaccine just not effective against the new variant? That's the question. CDC alarmed. 74% of cases in Cape Cod cluster were among the vax. I don't know how many of you have heard this news story, but a few of us have had. Uh, of the, this is this caught everyone by surprise. Of 469 cases linked, and I and I was skeptical, but even at my level of skepticism, I would not have expected to have such a an extraordinarily uh, poor outcome. Of the 469 cases linked to multiple summer events and large summer gatherings in a small town, 74% occurred in fully vaccinated people. And almost 80% of those cases were symptomatic. That's the part that gets me the most. Because in the normal wild, what do we have? 50% of the cases are symptomatic. In this case, among the vaccinated, only 20%, so I mean, asymptomatic. And in this case, 80% of those cases were symptomatic. So 20% were only asymptomatic. Again, it's there's too many variables to take into account, but however, though, that's food for thought to proceed down. Moreover, vaccination coverage in Massachusetts is reported to be 69% as July 3rd. So the target was 70%. So the 1% below it, but even then, think about it. That type of, I don't want to utilize the word vaccine failure. Let's just say the failure of this particular vaccine to be effective in that environment, that's better wording, is just astounding. And so here and then here we go here. And we're gonna go at they went to the PCR cycles and I'll show you that in a second. Walensky specifically pointed out to the high viral loads among the vaccinated in this case, suggesting that vaccinated people infected with the Delta variant can trans transmit the virus. This finding is concerning and was a pivotal discovery leading to the CDC's updated mask recommendation saying it was updated to ensure the vaccinated public would not knowingly transmit virus to others, including their unvaccinated or immunocompromised loved ones. And I understand the, the pretense, but however, though, after weeks of being demonized uh, because there's maybe questions in reference to the efficacy or other concerns, which everyone's entitled to have on their own, but almost to the point of inciting violent uh, retribution against individuals to ostracize them and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a pretty profound statement, even in this environment itself. Uh, but to proceed, of the 346 fully vaccinated cases, median age was 42. That is another interesting aspect. It's not so much the fact that they are infected at the age of 42 is the fact that you had so many symptomatic cases at the age of 42, where normally younger individuals tend to be more asymptomatic. 87% were men, which is way, way high out, I mean, as far as correlation. The most common symptoms were cough, headache, sore throat, myalgia, and fever. Mean interval from completion of the last 14 days after the vaccine was 86 days. So that gives you an idea. Also, too, a lot of the articles that you and I have re reviewed from show that antibodies tend to drop off pretty strongly after three months. Now, there was one research or non-peer-reviewed research article produced by Pfizer, which had, so yielded 84% in nine months. But I think it was just 
with number one, it's non peer reviewed. So even if you're a fact checker, how are you supposed to fact check a non peer review article that's not been released to the public to peer review? So you just can't have the manufacturer say whatever it wants to say in light of all the other studies coming out, which are actually study studies, which are peer reviewed, showing that the antibodies drop off pretty darn fast and are undetectable in certain individuals, especially if they're older, within three months. And 86 days is how close to three months. Case in point. All right, let us proceed to the next part on what we're looking at. Uh, I'm gonna go into where is, wait, before I, be, before I go to the Israeli study. Well, let's just bring up the Israeli, Israeli study to get out of the way. All right, there have been had began a breakthrough case of vaccinated workers, and what it was was about I think two point nine percent, two point six percent. So please correct me. Uh, a breakthrough cases, but that was on reference to the um, the you know the B one one seven the Alpha variant, not the Delta. But I wanted to show you at the exact same time it's beginning to happen with uh, regard to different variants. And these are frontline individuals. So let's just close that one out and let's go to the, the CDC's actual report. Here we go, ready? And this is not, a med page today, by the way, was the reference on that one. And that's a wonderful, wonderful article site. So this is what we're looking at. This is the CDC's article. And this is July 30th, 2021. Let's read the headline. The 14 day average of COVID-19 incidents went from zero cases, this, that was this, we're talking about Cape Cod now, where the major outbreak among the vaccinated occurred. Zero cases per 100,000 per day. All right, by July 17th, the 14 day average incident increased to 177 cases per 100,000 per day in the residents of the town. Look at that velocity. Look at the speed. You have to think the speed of transmission, even though it's a tourist area and everything else like that, you have people being tested uh, regardless. You know, you have guest houses, rental homes, whatever it comes down to be. You're talking an incubation time between 7 and 14 days. So you're taking all those factors into account. Going from 0 to 177 in 14 days is astounding. There's got to be some confounding out there that we're not looking at. But still, just the same, it was astounding. And it referenced the hospitalizations. There were very few hospitalizations. There was one unvaccinated individual which was hospitalized in four vaccinated individuals, just for those who want to uh, look at the whole data as far as severity. And But I don't know if that's any different than the general population with the Delta variant. The Delta variant seems to be, have a high transmission rate but a low severity rate, to make any sense. Let's continue through here. This is a really great chart in reference to looking at the fully vaccinated, uh, reference to cases and the unvaccinated. Uh, now again, not known proportion of the population. Uh, you know, if most everyone's vaccinated, you're not gonna have a lot of unvaccinated to catch the virus. So again, I wanna make sure I eliminate confounding, we're not, but we're not focusing on to see who did better. Uh, I, want to, I want to take that away. Who did better, the vaccinated or unvaccinated? Take that out of the equation. The question is, did, are the vaccinated, do they have a lower viral load in reference to transmission than the unvaccinated? That is the question we'll look at. Is the vaccine doing anything to prevent transmission? Going back to the British Medical Journal, which had questions of that in reference to the vaccine trials in October 2020. And here we come with the answer, right there. Now, this is, uh, again, certain cycles. The lower the cycles, I believe, the, the higher the viral load, because you detected it earlier. Uh, the CT value, chain reaction cycle threshold for specimens of patients with infections associated with large public gatherings, da 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 And it's not a statistically significant. Uh, in fact, if you recognize the, you know, the box plot here, you're looking at, 50% of your figures will fall here. And then close to about, what do you say, 97%? Well, 25, 25, but you know, there's always gonna be outliers. So I wanna say close to 97% because I'm, I'm working off of standard deviations. I will fall between the whiskers, the whiskers, just the whiskers. So you have a pretty good range here, but you also have a, a larger group of fully vaccinated, which have the virus. Uh, but the viral loads, 
quote, this might mean that the viral load of the vaccinated and unvaccinated persons infected with SARS-CoV-2 is similar. However, microbiological studies are required to confirm these findings. That's the caveat. If we ever hear from that, it'll be quite interesting. But however, though, that I'd focus more on this in reference to questions uh, to the efficacy of transmission then I would focus on the number of people who were vaccinated and not vaccinated who were sick. Because in the end, transmission rates, for example, you can, I mean, I don't want to utilize the word wild excretors, uh, but however, though, it's interesting. Now, the question is in reference to why a vaccine may have a problem. I want to go to a little bit of history and I am going to be very careful on how I say my words of what happened in April 20th of 2012 in reference to the SARS-CoV-1 vaccine. And I'm not going to explain much. I'm going to leave it for your own speculation and investigation. Immunization, I'll link it as well. Immunization with SARS coronavirus vaccine leads to pulmonary immunopathology on challenge with SARS virus. All right, please forgive me if I don't elaborate. Significant reductions of SARS CoV 2, SARS CoV, I'd be careful because there's two and not to be confused with SARS CoV 2, two days after challenge was seen for all vaccines in prior live sars cov Now, keep in mind, these trials were not done on mRNA, but they were done in reference to S proteins. You know what those are. These sars cov vaccines all induced antibody and protection against infection with sars cov However, here we go. Challenge of mice given any of the vaccines led to the occurrence of TH2 type Immunopathology suggested hypersensitivity to SARS-CoV components was induced. Caution in proceeding to application of a SARS-CoV vaccine in humans is indicated. Proceeding down. That's what the vaccines we're working on. The SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Keep in mind, we're doing DNA vaccines we did not use. And we're using a multitude of other types of vaccines that basically were utilized. But let's look at the outcome. So I don't want to compare, I don't want to give the assumption comparing apples to oranges is the same as comparing apples to apples. But just the same, uh, it's worthy of thought to proceed. And down 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 and down. All they did tons of studies. I mean, you wonder why is that? I mean, how long have we been trying to get a vaccine against the cold virus and that's coronavirus? Why have we not been successful with the SARS-CoV-1 virus per se? But let's. This is why we're not successful with the SARS-CoV-1 virus. All right. I want you to pay attention to this chart too for immunologists and so on and so forth. Uh, S protein again. Th- th- it may be different with mRNA. I don't know what I don't know what protocols were given in reference to protection against something like this. Yes, it offered protection. Yes, it also caused immuno- immunopathology and um, and ferrets and non-human primates. But um, hamps is a whole virus and so on and so forth. Different types they tried. Ready? And then we go down and we'll read. The combined experience provides concerns for trials with SARS-CoV vaccines in humans. Clinical trials with SARS coronavirus vaccines have been conducted and reported to induce antibody responses and to be safe. However, the evidence for safety is for a short period of observation. It's kind of like when you have emergency use authorization. You tend to really condense that phase three part of the um, trials down. Additionally, safety concerns relate to effectiveness and safety against antigenic variants of SARS-CoV and for safety of vaccinated persons exposed to other coronaviruses. Again, particularly the type two group. Again, this link will be there for you to follow on your own. And I don't want you to uh, extrapolate something that does not is not there. 
This is just why this particular vaccine references SARS-CoV-1. If I'm sounding cryptic, yeah, I'm doing, uh, yeah, being cryptic, cryptic intentionally. Uh, try not to uh, imply a, a strong correlation, just of interest why the SARS-CoV-1 vaccine trials often failed to proceed. Additionally, a more intense study for virus replication including quantitative RT-PCRS assays, which we both looked at, that was an RT-PTSCA assay, right there, you see right there? So that's just to give you an idea. So it might have confirmed the probability of virus replication is required for induction of the immunopathology after vaccination. So what I believe occurred here is everything worked fine on the first challenge or first exposure, but then, uh, see, this suggests that presentation of the S protein in the vector format may direct immune responses in a different way so that sensitization does not occur is what they're trying to do. Uh, and again, this is RDNA vaccines. So again, Food for thought. Uh, in reference to, I just wanted to give you an idea of why this, one of the reasons why the SARS CoV 1 vaccines uh, induce sensitization leading to immunopathology with infection, uh, in reference to that light. But out of that, let us go right into the databases per se. That was not cryptic enough. I don't know how exactly how more I can be. And that's the, the EU ally emergency authorization for medications. Let's get right into the database. Though. Let's go into the vaccine thing. Are you ready? Here we go. Ba, 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 ba. And we're going to get to see how much we can cover in 10 minutes. And uh, da, da, and here we go. Server injuries by age needs verification. Again, uh, for the fact checkers, right off the bat, if you're coming in midpoint, I already gave a disclaimer. Reports contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, unverifiable. So again, large part reports of errors are voluntary, which means it's subject to biases. So let us review once again. Here we go. Report of serve injuries by age. These verification, 1,727. Uh, reports, doesn't mean. Remember, reported to. Let's, let's change that wording. So these are the 1,727 server injuries were reported to VARES. It does not mean these are 1,727 reports. One, one way of wording it uh, gives a finality. The other way of wording it means requires confirmation. You see what it means? So requires confirmation. Shingles. <laughs> I'm excited about 11,247 reports that need verification. Average age right here. Bell's palsy. This is how we're doing it, right here. You see, for the uh, we're doing a little uh, method here. Bell's palsy, palsy, Bell's palsy, palsy. So we're going through the database and we're pulling out terms. Each term will yield only one Vera's ID because we removed the duplicates. All right, so here we go. Three thousand two hundred and seventy-three Bell's palsy reactions that need to be researched. All right, after that, and you can read a little bit here. We'll go into more detail. Thrombocytopenia, 1,144 reports that need to be validated or researched. You can, and again, you can read part of the articles here about Bell's palsy, sort of left cheek. I'll, I'll stop here once in a while. This is going to be at 4K. Uh, this is next one I'm doing is reference to paralysis. So if you want to read a tidbit, on how tragic a lot of these things are, uh, or on things, these reports. And you could also research as well. You could pull up the VAERS ID as well on the CDC site just to validate. Uh, so I'm going to move a little slower. Uh, yeah, it's it's really sad. I mean, it's, I mean, it doesn't mean the vaccine caused it. But, but these individuals, from their reports, these are not just people saying, oh, I just... I don't feel good. Give me money. These are pretty, pretty solid reports uh, that need to be investigated. 
Paralysis, 2,569. Remember, paralysis may contain paralysis and a little bit of Bell's palsy right there. They could, call it, they, they could be a union of sets. And so, yeah, let's proceed. Myocarditis, again, the outliers, the age that comes out of the middle of nowhere. And uh, so 1,546. Thrombosis, clotting. Remember, COVID can cause that as well, so it could be a correlation. 3,074 reports that need to be validated. COVID-19 illness to reactions. Now, this is what I did. All right. Number one, this is the search terms we have. But in order to produce this result, I also removed the VAX type. You can see right here, dropped. VAX type, VAX name, and symptom text. So I made certain when I went to this the string search, I did not, for those, I apologize for those not data oriented. I'm trying, but this may not mean much to you. But however, though, I'm trying to prevent duplication of reports or mis or misnomers. So I removed vax type because the vax type will often be called like um, uh, like it will say like vax type is COVID, and so right there's a vax name. So if you do an alpha search for COVID-19 and the vax name is COVID-19, yeah, then obviously you're gonna have like 400 and you know, 80,000 or 28,000, well, actually 480,000 because of duplicate reports. So those are all dropped. I dropped those columns for the data analyst. And we come up with 59,317 reports that need to be investigated of individuals who somehow, in their mind, believe they uh, succumbed to COVID as a result of the vaccine, possibly. Those investigations have to be made, and the CDC have to make a determination. That's the average age right there. All right, and then I want to pause this real fast. If anybody wants to read, you can read exactly um, what they were, especially if you had this, this uh, process the 4K, which takes about a week. And this was interesting, too. All right, if you read here, you see all these things that look like a report. This has to deal with, I think, 44 individuals. You read that right there. That did not receive a vaccine. The vials in the box identified they were, they were said it was the Moderna vaccine, but they were actually COVID-19 antibodies. And this was a reference to, uh, was given to us by the National Guard. So if you see this, these are actually all individuals, uh, which just duplicated the line of the reports that all received something that was not a vaccine so again that's amazing and all the various ids are there for you to validate on your own top now the duplicates the biggest mistake a lot of people are doing when they're doing the database they're coming up with these huge numbers but for these are the various ids and these are how many reports they filled out so basically it creates a long length of the database which would easily cause a person to make far more reports. You hear these weird death tolls that are being extrapolated uh, because what they're doing it, for example, like this right here, uh, VARES ID 1306674, they must have made you know, 22 separate reports because they have to put all the symptoms on there. But the problem is you know, it's only one person, not 22 separate people. And that's the biggest mistake a lot of individuals are, are making when looking at the database is not removing the duplicates. And for example, here, once again, this is all this one individual with all symptoms, five columns of symptoms, but they had to fill out so many different, they had to fill out so many different reports. Uh, but let's proceed. Going down, down, down the line, down the line. Uh, vaccine reports, ba ba ba, that's preferred vaccine. Uh, reactions by age. Um, and a pause this as well if you want to look at these are people that died um, and often uh, you know they just die that does I mean that's just like some things are just like reported resident expired resident expired deceased uh, so again you have to you know I don't want to read many of these to you because the, the real world uh, events and if, and they're not they're really really hard to read because these people did, did not have a peaceful um, 
exit from this life. Uh, reported COVID vaccine related deaths, 5,596. Again, it has to be investigated. Needs verification. Let's keep on going down the line. The varies by week. It'd be great if I got that timestamp fixed, but there it went down a little bit because vaccine levels went down. All right. Uh, COVID mortality, that's going down a little bit. Uh, mortality to various reports uh, right there. So this is the actual people dying of COVID uh, in the wild. And these are people that actually have reported number of deaths to the vaccine various report. Um, so on and so forth. Rolling seven, I'm just going to move fast because we have very little time left. That's the reactions, 428,483 of 2021 compared to 57,115 of 2020. That's where we're standing at right now. Uh, most common reactions, we're going to head to uh, by text size. Uh, if you want to read the word cloud, or you can look at this, top 30 reported symptoms by all ages. I'm going to control, I'm going to bounce around a little bit for a second. Here we go. There it goes. Um, basically right here. So those most com the common complaints. I dang it, I forgot to remove chest x-ray, but still just the same. Uh, and this is all ages. Now the interesting part about that is chest pain has now come to the fourth most common complaint. All right. And then this is the most common complaints of those upon deaths. Again, it's just, there it is. It's just cardiac arrest. It's, it's really, it, again, it's correlates across all spectrums. And these are the people that died. These are the most common complaints either or, or observations. Uh, and you see COVID-19, cardiac arrest. Uh, you know, you see a lot of it, interesting uh, correlating data that needs to be validated. All right. And then lots by numbers, da da da. This is in children. Number one thing that stands out like a sore thumb, chest pain. Even though it's number four, for example, right there, chest pain right there, it's rising up on all ages now. I don't know why. Uh, and then we scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. Uh, please forgive, uh, forgive me for the speed that I'm going. All right. Next, I want to show you is this mutations. All right, and this is important because I want to show you the difference. This is why correlation and causation are interesting. This is the ten week back on ten weeks. This is the variant trend in the United States. There's alpha, there's delta, there's the others. You see the dates. Deaths per million in the United States. You see a little bit of rise in the 10 week area. And I forgive me for having this behind there, but there's Delta and that's Delta right there. You see there, Delta. Positivity rate, right there, there's Delta. Now here comes the confounding. Are you ready for the confounding? So our mortality as far as is not really a, a great spike and positivity rates are quite high. And now, if we look at our world and data, you ready for this? We're gonna go this. Da, 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 da. I guess we're gonna finale it right here, and and we'll call it a night. If we look at this, here we go. United States vaccination rate, way up here. So we're pretty close to fifty percent of the population being fully vaccinated. India, it's about one percent more than we did last week, so it's about seven point three seven percent. So in India, seven point three percent of the population is fully vaccinated. United States, 49.09% fully vaccinated. Now, this is important to draw conjecture in reference to vaccine effectiveness in the Delta variant. Now, we saw the breakthrough cases. We saw the reports from Cape Cod. Now, let's look at the data. Now, we're, there we saw the United States. Ready? Positivity rate? Positivity rate. United States, about 50% fully vaccinated. Remember India? All right. There's your Delta variant, which is pretty much now 100% in all of India. Deaths per million. Right there. There's your Delta variant. How's deaths per million again compared to the United States? India has fewer deaths per million by far than the United States. Now, you ready for this? 
What's the positivity rate you think India would have? Right there. That's your positivity rate in India. What's the difference here? Let me show you. India is how much vaccinated? Oh, I can't get to the very end there. Ah, 7.3% fully vaccinated. United States, oh, what happened to the United States bounced off there? The United States, 49 point something vaccinated, 49% vaccinated. Positivity rate, India, what is that, like 0. 0.02? Positivity rate, United States, 0. 0.045, about double. Now, you know what? You could probably say a little bit less, even though it's only 7%, because you have to look at the, make sure you're looking right here at the zero. So it kind of throws you off. So basically, yeah, I would say the positivity rate, there it is. I'm looking at the wrong one. I'm looking at mortality. Point to, sorry. Phew. Wow, that was an idiotic move on my part. 0.02, you would say? What would you guess? 0.02? I'll run the figures on that a little bit later on. And the positivity rate once again? You know, it's because I'm only going back because I messed up. 0 0.045. 0 0.02. Vaccination rate? 7.37 for India, 49.09. If you were an alien from another planet and you had to make a rational judgment based upon the information presented before you, a reference to the effectiveness of the inoculation of a particular culture on that surface between two cultures, between, let's say, for example, India and the United States, and India only had inoculation rate, and you're getting you're an alien from another world, and you see 7.3%. And you're not going to get any repercussions for saying anything that may not, uh, indicate virtue signaling. Uh, and you looked at the positivity rate being about a third of the other place where the inoculation rates are 40.9.09. And including also has a higher mortality. How now based upon not looking at other confounding factors, if you had to look at that on its own, what, uh, what would you speculate would be the effectiveness of the transmission reduction in reference to certain inoculation procedures. Well, with that in mind, let us review what we just reviewed. All right, here we go. We looked at the VAC, the various database. There's other databases I did not get a chance to cover, but it's already 60 minutes. Please forgive me. Uh, we covered basically going backwards. Da da da. Emergency authorization uh, for our treatments uh, that are not uh, that are not vaccination. I believe it looks right there. Boom, boom, boom. Um, and then we looked, we covered the various data set. We covered, this is where I got our, oh, I didn't get a chance to show you the hospital information, but we'll show the next week. You should review that. Um, the various added disclaimer, the, uh, immunization with SARS coronavirus vaccines, these are pulmonary immunopathology unchallenged with, with SARS COV and not to intend to be misleading. This is in 2012. And it's not SARS COV 2, but SARS virus. Remember, it's a little different. COVID 19 breakdown. Uh, we recognize breakdown. Where it is. Breakthrough infections to healthcare workers in Israel with the original Alpha variant, B117. Uh, I don't know how they respond to the Delta variant. Uh, CDC alarmed, uh, reference to 74% of the cases uh, in the vac people who are fully vaccinated. Again, Fully, va fully vaccinated. And 80% of those cases were symptomatic. Um, I don't know. I would be curious if your news organizations you listen to actually presented the CDC information. Uh, the British Medical Journal will review that again back from October 2020. A reference to their concern, a reference to the vaccine trial, which obviously has come to fruition uh, at the present day. Um the, basically, the blue brain uh, look at, uh, correlating glucose as being the number one greatest determiner determinant 
in reference to the outcome uh, or severity of COVID-19. So I think that was incredible research and a great coordination between all the other uh, medical uh, news outlets. Doo -doo -doo. And there'll be links to that as well. Uh, don't worry about your money. Number two, and probably one of the coolest breakthroughs I've seen yet and brought to us by Britta Nora Inzinia, uh, in reference to basically, it makes it sound so freaking easy uh, about these miracle alpacas where if, by, if the, there's a variant change, all you got to do is just re-immunize them and the antibodies uh, that are helped produce with the help of these alpacas can ironically at some point um, be an extreme benefit to humankind if you're into that type of speciesism. But yeah, there it is. And I've all links set up for you. And again, it is now 2.17 a.m. Gratitude, thank you. Gratitude to all of the researchers. And again, regardless of what side of the aisle they're on, even the CDC, because without the CDC to collect in the data, um, you know, what database will I have to report on a reference to VARES? So it, it's got to be, you know, there's, they got the data. So again, but it's, it's safety signals looking for it. They need to validate it. So you still got to be thankful for them for that regardless. Uh, thank you to Our World and Data. Thank you to uh, GIS Aid, who now is keeping track of the, uh, the variants. We'll go into more next week. Uh, and to all the researchers out there, which uh, is pretty cool. And otherwise, look forward to see you all once again next week. And we will have more information from the alpacas. All right, catch you all next time. Bye.